Hi, and welcome back to this uh, video in the Biological Psychology video course. In this video 6.2, we're going to take a look at attention. Now, what is attention? Attention is a selection process. It's the selection of one thing over another. And that one thing that can be anything. It can be one aspect of visual input. Right? So if you have multiple things in front of you, you can co pay attention to one thing and not the other things, right? Visual attention. You can also pay attention to a memory. Right? You have a lot of a lot of memories in your long-term memory that are not at any moment active. If you if you remember, you activate one of these memories. That you could say that that's a form of internal attention, where you select one memory over the other memories. But it's a very different form of attention, of course, than visual attention, where you visually pay attention to something. You can also pay attention to a sound. So imagine that you're at a party where a lot of people are having conversations. Then you generally are able with some effort to, to pay attention to the person that you are talking to and more or less ignoring all the disrupting conversation around you. So that would be a form of auditory attention. Now, and there are many, many forms of attention that you can think of. For example, right now, I'm also, my attention is focused on my visual sense mostly and also my, my hearing because I'm listening to myself speak and I'm looking at myself also in the, the, the screen of the camera. And I'm not so much paying attention, for example, to the feeling of the carpet under my, uh, on, under my feet, right? So, that, so this is a, a way to pay attention to one modality over the other modalities. So... Attention is not really one thing. There's not one process that is attention. Rather, uh, selection is really a very important uh, part of all cognitive processes. And we've already seen different forms of attention in different sections of this video course. And attention is really an umbrella term that describes all these different forms of selection that are so important for us and for every cognitive process. Now, attention can be directed in space and in time. So especially when we're talking about visual attention. And then we're going to take a look at a few famous paradigms. So in a paradigm is basically one very stereotyped exper experiment, psychology experiment. Uh, for example, the Posner-Cuing paradigm uh, developed by the psychologist Michael Posner. Visual search, we won't take, really take a look at it, but visual search is a class of experiments in which participants have to search visually for one item among a larger set of, uh, of other items. And we're also going to take a look at the so-called attentional blink paradigm, which is used to study uh, temporal forms of attention. But let's start with the posner cuing paradigm. It's a very, very simple paradigm, but I think it illustrates very well some key components of attention. So the, the task for the participant in this paradigm is to respond to the circle. So the circle here is, this, uh, is, is here at the bottom, and the participant, for example, has to press the space bar as soon as this circle appears. Uh, or, for example, indicate whether the circle is on the left or the right side, or maybe indicate the color of the circle. The exact task doesn't really matter as long as the participant has to do something with that circle. Now, the location, and that is important, the location of the circle is predicted by this, this arrow cue that you see here in the center. So if the cue points towards the left, as it is the case now, the circle will also, with 75% probability, appear on the left, and on 25% of the trials, it will appear on the other side. Uh, and then what happens is that if participants see the error queue, then, and they know that the error queue pr uh, predicts the location of the target, of course they will shift their attention to the queued side, right? The left side in this case. Now, and what you then find is that participants make fewer errors and make faster responses on validly queued trials. So trials in which the target indeed appeared on the side predicted by the queue. And more errors and slower responses on these other trials. And this, uh, this shows very simply, that we are able to voluntarily direct our attention to a location in space, right? Because this arrow cue, the, the, this requires us to interpret, right? What, what this, this cue means. It's an arrow that points to the left. Once we've interpreted the meaning of this cue, and we are aware that the, the cue predicts the location of the target, then voluntarily through an act of will, we shift our attention to the left in this case. And that is called endogenous attention because the shift of attention is endogenous. It comes from within us, right? So it shows one aspect of attention that we are able to exercise voluntary control over what we attend to, to some, to some degree. Now, there's a variation of this paradigm in which the cue does not predict the location of the target. 
but it is simply a very salient event. And that, that is what you see here. So in this case, the Q is this, is this square. And participants have to ignore the square. And the location of the square also does not predict where the circle is going to appear. But the square is suddenly presented. It is a salient visual event. It automatically captures your attention, right? It's like a light that flashes and it automatically grabs your attention. And then what you find is that it's essentially the same pattern of results. So if the, the, the circle appears on the side of the Q, the, the, the square in this case, participants make fewer errors and they respond faster than when the circle appears on the other side. In other words, this, this salient Q, even though it is not relevant to the task at all, it nevertheless captures the attention of the participants and affects their subsequent behavior, namely the reporting of the target, the circle. Now, and what this shows is that attention can be automatically captured, right? It's, this is called exogenous attention because it is not, doesn't really, the shift of attention does not, not come from within us, but it is imposed upon, up, upon us by the, by the environment, right? In this case, we have no voluntary control over the shift of attention. And even what is more, even if we want to ignore the, 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 the rectangle, because we know, for example, that it disrupts our performance on this task, then you are not able to do so because it really automatically grabs your attention and you have very little control over that, right? So together, these two paradigms show that two properties, very simple properties of attention. A, you often voluntarily control what you attend to, but B, you don't always voluntarily control what you attend to, right? And that matches, I think, very well how we intuitively feel uh, that our attention is driven. Now, as I mentioned, attention can not only be directed in space, as, as we saw in the Posner queuing paradigm, but it can also be directed in time. Uh, and in that case, it means selecting one moment over another moment. So in a ve very famous paradigm to test this is the so-called attentional blink paradigm. And this is a bit of a strange paradigm. So take a moment to uh, bear with me and take a moment to think about the logic behind this paradigm and then it will become clear. So how it works is that participants see a stream of very rapidly presented letters, for example, 100 milliseconds per letter. So in this case, that would mean the participants first see a cross in the center of the screen, screen and then they see M, A, T, D, X, Y, I. Now, there are two targets that the participant has to, uh, has to report. The first target in this case is the colored letter. And the second target is an X, which is present on 50% of the time of, of the trials. So basically the participant sees all this, these letters, right? That flash by very rapidly. And then we ask the participant, okay, what was the colored letter? And the participant has to say, in this case, it was a T. And did you see an X or not? And in this case, the participant would have to say, yes, I saw an X, right? And the T is the first target or the T1, as it is soft, sometimes called. And the X is the second target or the T2. Now, so there are two targets. And there is a crucial manipulation, namely the lag between the two targets. So here you see that in between the T and the X, so the first and the second target, there is the D, which is a distractor. It's an irrelevant letter. So this we call a lag two because there is a displacement of two, right? Two positions between the T and the X. But on some trials, there, these displacements will be longer and on some trials it will be shorter. So we vary basically the distance in time between the first and the second target. Now, and then what you generally find uh, is that uh, is the following pattern of results. If the T2 very rapidly follows the T1, attention is impaired. And you can see this in this graph if you look at the green line. So what you see here is on the x-axis, the lag. So basically lag three means that the second target was presented three positions in time after the first target. And on the y-axis, you see the accuracy of reporting the second target. So saying whether there was an X or not given uh, that participants reported the first target correctly. And what you see is that basically there is a dip and this dip is called the attentional blink. Um, what this means is that if participants see the first target, then their attention gradually briefly shuts down, right? So at, at lag zero, they see, they see the first target and then they start processing that target and you essentially, your attention shuts down, blinks. And as your attention starts to blink, you become progressively worse in detecting the second target. And the worst performance in this particular experiment was at lag three. So, and then after lag three, your attention kind of opens up and you go back to the original performance again, if you compare that to a control condition, right? So here we see selection in time because at time zero, participants see the first target, they're selecting that. 
that goes at the expense of the second target if it is presented shortly after the first target, the attentional blink. So it's a clear demonstration of selection in time. Um, and of course, this is compared to a control condition indicated in orange here, where there was only a T2, right? So whether there was only an, an X present or not. And this shows, as I already said a few times, a lapse or a blink of attention in time. Attentional blink. Now, now that we've looked at these basic forms of attention, right? Spatial attention, as shown by the Posner queuing paradigm, and ten temporal attention, as shown by the, the attentional blink paradigm, visual attention in both cases. Uh, let's take a look at how we can explain some aspects of attention uh, from a neurobiological perspective. Now we're going to take a look at the biased competition theory, uh, which explains how explains some aspects of attention, especially visual attention. And this theory is a very elegant theory that was proposed uh, by John Duncan, whom, whom we've already seen uh, during the, the, the second lecture on neurons and brain anatomy, when I recommend his book, uh, How Intelligence Happens. Right? So, as, as I mentioned, then he's a very big name in the field, John Duncan. Now, the idea of biased competition is that stimuli uh, compete for neural representation and that attention determines which stimulus wins the competition. Now, that sounds kind of abstract, but we can make it more concrete with a few, a few examples. Um, and this has been studied mostly for visual attention, but I think the, 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 the ideas behind biased competition are also applicable to different forms of attention. But here we're going to take a look at visual attention. And I should emphasize that biased competition is just one model of, uh, of attention, and there are different models of attention that describe different uh, aspects of attention. Because as I said, attention is not really one thing. It is a collection of cognitive processes that is described by many different models, of course. But here, I think biased competition is quite elegant and quite a nice example. So imagine a neuron that responds to only one part of the visual field, and we call that the neuron's receptive field. And we've already seen the concept of a receptive field in the, the perception section. So what it means basically is that we have this neuron here, and this neuron only looks, you could say, at this part of the world indicated by the circle. He's only interested in things that appear within this, this part of the world. That's its receptive field. So the, the neuron is selective in space. The neuron is also selective in what it responds to. It is actually, you could say, a simple cell that we've met in the perception section, and it responds only to uh, rightward tilted line segments. Now, so you see, if there's this rightward tilted line segment, the activity bar is full, it's completely red, so this neuron starts to fire very highly, strongly. Now, if a leftward tilted line segment is presented in its receptive field, then that is a non-preferred stimulus for this neuron and the neuron does not really respond to it. So the activity is low, right? Now, what happens now if we present both a preferred stimulus, so the rightward tilted line segment and a non-preferred stimulus, the leftward tilted line segment in its receptive field, you might think that the activities add up, right? So that the neuron starts to fire even more, right? With the sum of the, the activities that each uh, stimulus elicits on its own. But that's not the case. Activity is intermediate, and it is not the sum of the, the two activities. Rather, it is kind of the average, approximately. So what is happening is essentially that the presence of the non-preferred line segments dri drives the response of the neuron to the preferred line segment down. Right? So it reduces the response to the preferred li segment, line segment. And conversely, the presence of the preferred line segment increases the response of the neuron to the non-preferred line segment, you could say. So there, the two stimuli are kind of mutually inhibitory, and the result is that the neuron starts to fire with an intermediate firing rate, as indicated here in this, uh, in this bar. But attention can change this, and that is the key tenet of biased competition. So if we attend to the rightward tilted line segment, to the preferred stimulus, then uh, the activity goes up. And this means, in a sense, that the, the, the preferred stimulus is represented and the non-preferred stimulus is ignored. In other words, the neuron starts to fire fully as though only the rightward tilted line segment were, were present in its receptive field, right? And the non-preferred line segment is completely ignored. In other words, the preferred line segment has won the competition. Conversely, if we attend to the non-preferred stimulus, then activity goes down, meaning that the preferred stimulus is ignored. Right? And the non-preferred stimulus is represented. In other words, if we covertly attend to the non-preferred line segment, the left or tilted line segment, 
The neuron response as though only this leftward tilted line segment were present in its receptive field and the other preferred stimulus is ignored. Right? You could also say, and I think that's an important point, that the non-firing of this neuron is a way for this neuron to represent the presence of a non-preferred stimulus. Right? Not firing is just as legitimate a way to represent something as firing is. Right? Now, so to summarize biased competition, when multiple stimuli are shown, attention determines which stimulus wins, right? which stimulus drives neural activity. And the other stimuli that are not attended are ignored. And I have a very nice picture here. I'm not sure why I chose, <laughs> chose that animal. Okay, now with that, let's move on to the next video, video 6.3, in which we're going to talk about consciousness.